Good afternoon. I'm Nick Lotz, president of the British American Business Council of Greater Philadelphia and managing director, head of business development at Santander Bank. Welcome to the British American Business Council of Greater Philadelphia and the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia's Global Climate Change event. It's an honor to be here with you today. Thank you for joining us for our second in a series of three British American Business Council 30th anniversary programs. The BABC PHL is a membership organization dedicated to prom promoting trade and commercial relationship between the greater Philadelphia region and the UK. We work closely with public and private sector regional and international entities to advance our mission. Today, we are honored to partner with the renowned World Affairs Council of Philadelphia to present a joint climate change discussion between two influential nations about the multilateral global approach to the race to net zero. This timely program is being offered just a few weeks before world leaders gather for the 26th United Nations Climate Change Conference of Parties, or COP26, in Glasgow, Scotland. It is our pleasure to welcome a distinguished panel of speakers from the US and the UK government, as well as private sector executives. Today's webinar will highlight the collaborative effort and a few of the many programs and services that are involved in the race to net zero here in Philadelphia, throughout the US, the UK, and the world. Global environmental health and safety is influenced and dictated by many factors. One hour is not nearly enough to cover the multifaceted dimensions of this vital and complicated topic. We hope you enjoy today's discussion about the subnational level engagement in both the public and private domains, connections between human environmental health in relation to delivering an equitable sustainable recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic, the green recovery, the, the important role of innovation and corporate investor and employee responsibility with respect to the competitive advantage in business transition models. I'm proud to be president of a group that serves the international business community. The BABC PHL actively collaborates to build transatlantic opportunities contributes to positive change and enhances global partnerships aligned with important matters that are shaping the way we operate today and into the future. A special thanks to our distinguished panel of speakers, Ron Becker, Ellen Yitt Derringer, Mark Hillhouse, Michael Hughes, Christine Knapp, Kate Robinson, Jonathan Tench, and to our sponsors, Dwayne Morris and the Welsh government. To our event partners, the Chilean, Eurasian, French, German, Irish, and Japanese Chambers of Commerce, and the World Trade Centers of Delaware and Philadelphia. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you Lauren Schwartz, President and CEO of the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia. The organization provides strategic, nonpartisan speaking programs, youth education, leadership training, and unique travel opportunities worldwide. We have known Lauren for several years and worked with her when she served in her previous role as Deputy Commerce Director of International Business and Global Strategy for the City of Philadelphia. It's a pleasure to partner with Lauren and her team at the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia to deliver today's timely discussion. Lauren, thank you for collaborating with us to deliver today's program. Without further ado, I turn it over to you to introduce today's speakers. Great. Thanks, Nick. And it is good to see you, albeit virtually. One day we'll do this all in person with our audience members from the BABC and the World Affairs Council in uh, Philly at large. But without further ado, we'll get started virtually here. I have the pleasure of introducing our moderator and panelists for today's event. And boy, have we got an impressive lineup for you this afternoon. That's because this is such an important topic. There's so much to say. First, we have Kate Robinson, and she's head of the Energy and Environment Team at the British Embassy in Washington, D.C. Kate oversees the UK's engagement on the, in the U.S. on energy and climate issues at the federal and subnational level, both of which we'll talk about today. Next, we have Elliot Derringer, and he's a senior policy advisor in the Office of the Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, John Kerry's office. Elliot has been engaged on international climate issues for over 30 years and formerly served as the Executive Vice President of the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions before joining the US State Department. Jonathan Tench is the International Partnerships and Networks Change Maker in the Office of the Future Generations Commissioner for Wales, where he's responsible for supporting the Commissioner's international and private sector engagement. Ron Becker is the Senior Vice President of Operations and Sustainability at Brandywine Realty Trust, 
where he oversees all aspects of operations and property management for this farm building buildings all over the US. Mark Milhouse is a senior vice president and head of sustainable finance for US commercial banking at HSBC. Mark works with teams across the US and around the world to support climate tech firms, renewable energy developers, and other ESG focused companies to meet their sustainability goals. Michael Hughes is the Director of Sustainability and Responsible Business at Accenture, where he engages with clients on the intersection of the fourth industrial revolution technologies and sustainability. In addition to leading Accenture's involvement in the UN Global Compact Sustainable Development Goals Ambition and CEO study initiatives. And last but certainly not least, my former colleague and friend, our moderator, for this afternoon is Christine Knapp. She is the director of the Office of Sustainability for the City of Philadelphia. In her wide ranging role, Christine oversees the city's sustainability framework and manages the city's climate action program. You can learn more about each of these very impressive panelists in our digital program book. Welcome to you all and thank you for being with us at this critical discussion on a critical topic today. Christine, I'll pass the virtual microphone over to you. Thank you, Lauren, and thank you, Nick, as well, uh, for your introduction. I'm really happy to be with all of you today um, on this very important topic. Um, and I think everyone has probably already seen the Intergovernmental uh, Panel on Climate Change report that came out recently, uh, which really made clear that uh, climate change is no longer an issue of the future. It is an issue right now. And the impacts uh, that we're experiencing are actually speeding up at a rate uh, faster than what was previously predicted. So it's pretty dire warning that we're receiving, but we also know that we have the ability to act now. We have the tools that we need um, to address this climate crisis and to move to the healthy and sustainable future for, uh, for everyone that we want to achieve for the future. Here in Philadelphia, Mayor Kenny has committed Philadelphia to carbon neutrality by 2050. And we've issued our climate action playbook to outline the many steps we're taking to both reduce our carbon footprint and to make our city more resilient against the hotter and wetter climate that we're already starting to experience. But what we know is that we cannot in Philadelphia do this alone. We need action at every uh, level of government, public and private sector, uh, you know, residents, uh, everybody needs to be involved in this work. And with COP26 coming up later this month, it's an amazing opportunity to talk with this panel about this multilateral global approach on the race to net zero. So first up, we're gonna be speaking with our public sector representatives, um, Kate Robinson, again, from the head, the head of the energy and environment team for the British Embassy in, in DC. Kate, thanks for joining us uh, today. Um, could you start off, uh, start of, us off um, as the host uh, with the COP26 in Glasgow, can you let us know a little bit about what the UK's priorities are for COP26 this year? Of course, thank you. Thank you for inviting me today. Um, so it's six years ago now we're in Paris, world leaders came together and all agreed to keep global temperature rise to well below two degrees um, and aim to actually limit global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees. So COP26, which kicks off um, two weeks yesterday, so it's coming around quickly now, um, is the next kind of major moment under the Paris Agreement. And so in order to make sure that we deliver on the Paris Agreement, the UK um, as the president of COP26 and also in partnership with Italy have um, four main goals. Those are mitigation, adaptation, uh, finance and collaboration. Um, so mitigation, just very quickly, this is trying to address, address what we call the, the mitigation gap. So the Paris Agreement sets up a framework where every five years, countries who sign the Paris Agreement um, look at what they can do and whether they can take more action in something called NDCs, nationally determined contributions. So each country kind of sets out what are the percentage emission reductions that they're going to take and hopefully every five years can kind of bump that up and take more action. Um, so currently we're on track for over three degrees warming. So we really need to take substantive action now. And as you mentioned, the IPCC report set this out incredibly clearly. So we have been working over the last few years to encourage countries to come forward with increased ambition, um, both for their NDCs, which have a 2030 timeline, and also to come forward with net zero um, by 2050. Um, so that's the mitigation focus. Um, adaptation, you know, the climate is changing. Um, the most vulnerable communities tend to be on the front line of that changing climate. You know, we have to we have to focus on that now. We have to take action now. Um, under the Paris Agreement, um, we we are hoping countries will come forward with adaptation communications, 
everyone adaptation, um, but also there's a lot of different initiatives that we've um, set up that all encourage um, support for those communities that are already on the front line of the changing climate. Core part of that is finance, which is the third goal. And um, there are kind of two, broadly two components to the finance piece, there's the public and the private side. So um, there is something called the 100 billion commitment, um, where kind of the developed countries um, agree to provide $100 billion a year of climate finance um, to developing countries to support this transition. Um, so obviously that's a key, key focus to us to make sure that we can meet that goal. Um, but, you know, 100, 100 billion, as, as much as it sounds a lot, it's not enough to deliver on the Paris Agreement. We really need, you know, the private play a really leading role. So how do we transition our global financial system to be green, to be aligned with the Paris Agreement is a strong focus for us. And then finally, collaboration, which is kind of quite all encompassing, um, but includes um, how we're making sure as COP hosts that we are working not just with national governments, but with businesses, with subnational governments, with civil society right across the piece um, to deliver change in a couple of additional sectors that I haven't already mentioned yet. Um, one is transport, and there the primary focus is doubling the rate of transition to zero emission vehicles, particularly cars. So we want all new cars from 2040 uh, onwards to be zero emission. Um, energy, which is to try and accelerate the transition to kind of green power and particularly move away from coal. Um, and then finally, nature, which is the kind of the role of nature as a natural system, as a solution to climate. So how can we uh, better protect nature, better protect our forests? How do we green our different supply chains? Um, and so to, to bring in that kind of nature protection point, but also see nature as a key solution to, to meeting the Paris Agreement. Um, so it's a quick rattle through, it's quite a long list of priorities. That's great, yeah. And so, so on your last point there on collaboration, can you talk more about how the US and the UK are working together on the race to zero and how can folks joining us today um, support these, these uh, collaborations? Yeah, so the UK and the US are working closely across all of all of our objectives. We have a number of joint objectives that we're we're working on. Um, particularly, the race to zero is actually a specific initiative um, under COP, and that is um, initiative specifically focused on non-state actors, by which we mean people who have not directly signed the Paris Agreement, basically. So businesses, cities, states, um, civil society. And so the Race to Zero is an initiative that was set up by the high level champions um, to set up a framework to enable um, all of those different groups to commit to net zero, ideally in the 2040s, by 2050 at the latest. Um, but it's not just a kind of you know, here's a high level commitment that is a few decades away. It has a kind of structure that says, you know, we'll make this pledge for net zero by 2050. Um, and then this is the action we will take in the short term in order to deliver that. And it also encourages kind of annual reporting of progress. So um, we are working right across the US. We have hundreds of um, US partners already in net zero, on, sorry, in the race to zero. Um, and we really encourage everyone listening to think about whether you might you might be able to join that initiative. It's a really important way of kind of showcasing the progress that all the non-state actors are, are taking on climate action and also to kind of to help um, help in the messaging around COP and help help show that, you know, climate is an, is an all of society issue and it's an all of society solution and therefore that everyone has a kind of a role to play. I'm proud to say that Philadelphia is part of the race to zero. So we are one of those many uh, non-signers that are committed to the, the goals of the Paris Agreement and beyond. Uh, so Elliot, we're going to bring you in here. Um, Elliot Derringer is the Senior Policy Advisor in the Office of the Special Presidential Envoy for Climate. Um, so thank you for joining us as well. Um, similar question to you to start off, what are the U.S. government priorities and particularly if there are any initiatives to engage the private sector in this work? I, I could just first thank you, but I could just uh, start by saying ditto, because I think there is such close alignment between uh, UK and US objectives for COP26. Uh, you know, I might uh, package the, the objectives slightly differently. I'll, 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 I'll uh, tell you about our four objectives, but you'll find that uh, when you unpack them, uh, they, they really are virtually identical to what uh, Kate's already laid out. Um, you know, I, there are two really strong overarching themes to our objectives. The first is the absolute imperative of doing all we can 
heading into Glasgow and coming out of Glasgow to keep the goal of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees within reach. Uh, the second is that this is not just an imperative, but in fact, a, a huge economic opportunity. Uh, we, we see climate action as a tremendous uh, driver for economic growth and job creation, not just here in the U.S., but globally, uh, and really want to do all we can to uh, to take advantage of those opportunities and, and emphasize those opportunities. Um, my four objectives, our four objectives, the first is uh, uh, to demonstrate U.S. leadership, renewed U.S. leadership on climate action. After having stepped off the global stage on this issue, uh, President Biden has worked very hard to reestablish U.S. leadership, beginning with the Leaders Summit on Climate uh, that he convened in April, uh, where he put forward a very ambitious U.S. target, reducing emissions 50 to 52 percent below 2005 levels by 2030. Uh, he also has significantly increased U.S. finance for developing countries, working with Congress to quadruple uh, the level of finance from the previous peaks uh, under the Obama administration. And that includes a six-fold increase uh, in finance for adaptation efforts uh, in developing countries. And you'll see our, our really strong whole of government approach to this issue on full display in Glasgow, very strong participation across the cabinet uh, through the two weeks of the conference. The second objective is to leverage that U.S. leadership to really help drive global ambition. Again, not just heading into to Glasgow, but, uh, but heading out as well. Um, and, you know, beginning again with the Leaders Summit, uh, we have helped encourage other countries to step up uh, with stronger commitments. Uh, at this point, uh, well over half of the global economy has put forward targets in line uh, with keeping warming to that 1.5 degree goal. Uh, we are continuing uh, our very close engagement with a number of countries, even in these uh, remaining two weeks heading into the COP and are expecting to see further announcements. But we know we won't really get all the way there by the time of Glasgow. So it's important that countries commit collectively in Glasgow to continue strengthening their ambition in the months and years ahead. A third objective is uh, completing the Paris rulebook. Uh, these are the detailed implementation plans for implementing the Paris Agreement. Uh, most of that job has been done, but there are a few outstanding issues, and it's really critical that we get those wrapped up. Uh, one of particular uh, importance to the private sector is completing the rules for what's called Article 6, and this uh, relates to the use of market mechanisms, carbon trading. Uh, important to get those rules right to facilitate the carbon market by ensuring its environmental integrity. And, and fourth objective is to really catalyze concrete action uh, in line with the ambitious goals that countries are setting. Especially important uh, to really move the needle in this critical decade because uh, the science is telling us that this is the decade to really significantly reduce emissions if we want to keep the 1.5 degree goal within reach. Uh, and, and this is another area where the private sector plays a really critical role. Uh, so, you know, we've been framing up and we'll be launching a number of initiatives engaging the private sector. I'll, I'll mention just a couple. The first is what we call the First Movers Coalition, and we're doing this in partnership with the World Economic Forum. Um, and this is a platform that allows companies to take on purchasing commitments to help drive advanced technology, especially in the hard to abate sectors. So for instance, companies committing to procuring given quantities of zero carbon steel or zero carbon cement. Uh, this is really critical, especially in these hard to abate sectors. A, uh, a, a complementary initiative is what we call the clean energy demand initiative. Lots of companies have already set themselves very ambitious renewable energy goals. Um, this initiative provides them the opportunity to set specific clean energy investment goals in other countries. And, they, and then we will work with the governments in those countries 
to ensure that they put in place the, the kinds of enabling policies that will help the companies achieve their clean energy goals. So this is really a great way to leverage a corporate commitment here in the U.S. to stronger clean energy uh, uh, deployment in other countries. Just a couple of examples. So I'll, uh, I'll leave it there for the moment. That's great. Thank you for, for that. Um, you both covered a lot of ground in a short period of time. I'm wondering, um, Elliot, if you can think of any sticking points that you're anticipating will be you know, focused in the discussions and actions during COP and beyond. And, and Kate, if you wanted to add anything at, at the end as well around these sticking points where we know, you know are likely to come up. Well, uh, I'm not going to dive deep into the, the more technical negotiating issues where there are always many sticking points. But, and, uh, you know, oftentimes it really goes down to the, to the wire before those get resolved. Uh, I, I'd say, uh, you know, at a high level, um, we're still at the stage of getting all of the major economies on board with the imperative of 1.5 degrees. Uh, you know, the, the, this year's G7 summit was fully aligned around 1.5 degrees. Uh, at the, the G20 ministerial, uh, countries committed to come in <clears throat> with stronger NDCs, nationally determined contributions. But we haven't yet seen those uh, from some of the major players, including China. And uh, again, I don't think that we'll, we'll necessarily see those by the time of Glasgow, but that's why it's so important that we get agreement there on the necessity going forward of continuing to strengthen ambition. So I, I think one real challenge will be getting agreement from those countries that haven't yet stepped up uh, that, that they're going to commit to in the near future. Uh, and I, I think that that will probably be one of the, the major challenges we face. Anything you want to add? I mean, no, I completely agree with what Elliot said. I, I would just, I just underline Elliot's point that you know, COP twenty six really needs to be a massive kind of push forward over the next decade. Like we need, we need to be very focused on action, and that's obviously going to be the challenge. Is what are the kind of next steps after COP looking forward? But we, we know we have a matter of years, and we really need to shift our global economy. So I think that's a that's a huge focus for us, obviously at COP, to enable that kind of next big stepping stone over the next few years. Well, I really appreciate appreciate both of you being here today, but more so appreciate your work to really move this ahead. And we're going to be rooting for you in COP and hope that you walk away with uh, with those commitments for further steps. So thank you both so much. We'll now be moving over to our private sector panel. And uh, first up, we have Jonathan Tench, the Networks and Partnerships Partnerships Change Maker in the Office of Future Generations Commissioner for Wales. Jonathan, thank you for joining us. Um, I think to start off, explain to us what the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act is and what its objectives are. Sure, and thanks so much for um, having me. I was just saying earlier to the speakers, uh, I had the privilege of visiting Philadelphia and saw the Welsh flag flying on Benjamin Franklin uh, Parkway. So I was delighted to see that and all the connections um, with the Philadelphia region. The um, Wales has taken a leading step in terms of uh, innovating within governance for future generations. This is what we're talking about with climate action is leaving the planet in a state where future generations can still prosper and thrive. So in Wales in 2015, we took the UN Sustainable Development Goals and we actually became the first country to um, enshrine those goals into law. So we created seven Welsh wellbeing goals. Um, Christine, they're very similar to your outline of your um, wonderful sustainability strategy in the Office of Sustainability in Philadelphia, looking at the interconnectedness between mental health, green spaces, climate action, reducing obesity, and really drawing the interconnections um, around a well-being economy. Um, and the legislation in Wales from 2015 also established the first ever Future Generations Commissioner, my boss, Sophie Howe. So it's her job to advise Welsh ministers and Welsh public bodies that now have a legal duty to take in the interests of future generations in their policy making, we hold them um, uh, their feet to the fire. So the, um, the legislation um, requires that policymakers base policies and investments in Wales on the benefits, not just of current generations, but future generations. So it's putting the long term into policy making, whether that's in city governments here in Wales or 
um, the, the Ministry of Transport, um, the Ministry of Climate Change as it now is. Um, so it's about embedding a 10 to 25 year outlook on policy making, as opposed to and moving away from these three to five year policy cycles that we we often get lumped with uh, in, in various governments. That is so inspiring. Um, I really love that, that frame. Um, could you talk a little bit about how both public and private sector entities work, you work with those uh, entities to achieve your goals? Yeah, absolutely. And um, the, the legislation has been around now coming up to seven years. Just really quickly, some of the areas where we've seen the public sector take most of the action in Wales. We've seen transport policy shift on its head away from promoting the use of private vehicles. Uh, there's actually a freeze on all new roads in Wales. Instead, that investment is going into public transport and very similar to lots of your efforts in, in Philadelphia around active travel. Um, we've seen Wales become the third nation in the world in terms of household recycling. Uh, again, I know waste is an issue um, that you're looking at over um, that side of the pond. Um, and so it's really great to see some of those actions at that kind of public body level. Then in terms of the private sector, um, now this is where Wales' historical responsibility to address climate change comes in, you know, at the heart of the industrial revolution, we um, are still actually, we were the heart, uh, and we are still actually the second largest region in terms of um, uh, carbon emissions within the UK. Um, and so actually what's been really great in the last year or so is to see industry come together and have a look at how are we going to get to net zero. So thanks to some funding from the UK government, we've got the South Wales Industrial Cluster, which is now looking at investment in engineering studies. They've got a grant of over 20 million to, and it's led by the steel industry, to look at how do we go to a net zero um, economy uh, in South Wales and, and Wales as a whole. So that is looking at carbon capture and storage. It's looking at actually whether Wales has the potential um, to ship um, CO2 emissions through carbon capture and storage and, and various ways um, uh, overseas uh, could lead to exciting kind of new jobs. So that's, that's been really great to see um, the, that cluster develop. And actually what they've done is establish within the 29 or so companies with over 100,000 uh, employees, um, this cluster has set up a future generations board so that um, leaders under 30 in these businesses are in charge of looking at the sustainability strategies of these companies going forward. So a big drive to get to net zero in Wales. We bear a lot of the historical responsibility to act, but the more we put future generations in charge of policymaking, whether that's in the public sector or whether that's in the private sector, we're going to start seeing the results that um, that um, Kate and Elliot so um, eloquently sort of uh, told us all that we need to get to. So that's uh, that's the story from Wales. Again, so inspiring. And I, I think what's particularly of note is the way in which you're using climate action to improve the lives of people today and in the future. And so it's really powerful to not just have this messaging of the gloom and doom and the sort of warnings and you know sort of dire messaging, but really putting the positive spin on improving health, creating more vibrant communities. So really, I really appreciate that, that approach to the work. Unfortunately, we're out of time. I'd love to hear more, um, hear more about, maybe we'll circle back with some questions for you. Um, but now we are going to be moving on to Ron Becker, Senior Vice President of Operations and Sustainability at Brandywine Realty Trust. Ron, thank you for joining us. Um, can you thank tell us a little bit about Brandywine's uh, initiatives in 2022 from a sustainability perspective? Uh, certainly, and again, thank you very, very much for having me. So um, I oversee operations and sustainability here at Brandywine Realty Trust. For those of you who are not familiar with us, we are a publicly traded full service office suite based in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. We have 181 properties approximately in eight states covering about 24.8 million square feet. Um, <laughs> a culture that is really focused on more than just ROI uh, really try to bring positive impact to the local communities in which we are operating and in which we reside. Uh, we have a commitment to fostering uh, a culture of diversity and inclusion. Uh, we engage in environmental reduction goals to help fight uh, climate change and are happy to report that we have 12.4 million square feet of uh, green certified space, um, of which 67% of our global energy consumption is offset by green power procurement in all of our deregulated markets. Um, in terms of what's coming up, my gosh, do we have a loaded and packed 22. 
Um, I'm actually just drifting over my notes so I don't miss anything, frankly. Um, you know, obviously with, with uh, COVID has made, you know, companies are certainly more cognizant than ever uh, about safeguarding employee health and wellness. Um, and obviously predates the, pan the pandemic. Uh, it goes well beyond protecting people from just the virus. Um, we're focusing this year, we've installed uh, needle point bipolar ionization in every one of our elevators. So that as our uh, tenants come back, they're comfortable in which uh, in, in the items in their riding in. We're focused with well on about 3.3 million square feet that was just uh, was in the midst of getting approved for the health safety rating. Uh, we're working with the UL verification, which covers about uh, a little north of 2 million square feet. I'm sorry, actually, I take that back, 3.6 million square feet. Um, so this here is a lot about getting everyone back in the buildings, comfort, safety, certainly uh, indoor air quality being a critical focus, but at the same time, not giving back all of those reductions we've made uh, in, you know, in our, in our uh, consumption. Uh, the, the healthy balance that we're achieving is by working with uh, our ongoing commissioning experts to make sure that we are exceeding ASHRAE on both sides of, of what they have set as the parameters by at least two hours while monitoring those, you know, those setback points and all of those fun things with the, the engineering team so that we are not transferring or giving away the energy we've reduced just to accomplish health and wellness. We want to accomplish it all together in a very balanced uh, you know, and proactive manner, of course. So you know, uh, we are focused on that. We are stepping into the embodied carbon conversations. And one of the things which we will be announcing shortly, if not right now, is our uh, focus on net zero travel in partnership with a company called Goodwings out of the Netherlands so that we can plant trees to offset, offset excuse me, all of our corporate travel um, starting in calendar year 2022. I, I agree the, the silver lining of trying to figure out how to preserve the few benefits that we got out of the pandemic, including <laughs> energy efficiency. I mean, that's an air, air pollution as well from uh, travel being reduced. So yeah, I think that's a, a key priority. So I wanna switch gears and um, talk about ESG, which is a term we're hearing a lot about these days, environmental, social, and governance, um, which is really having sort of a moment right now. And it seems like most commercial real estate portfolios are meeting sort of the baseline requirements of, of a lot of ESG goals, but what do you think needs to be done to sort of push that um, further into the future and make sure that you know, we stay ahead of the curve on those goals? Well, I, I mean, look, I think we can absolutely agree that there has been a true paradigm shift uh, when it comes to sustainability. And I think we've advanced seven to 10 years in that one year of COVID, which frankly is a good thing because we needed to do it. Um, you know, I think that ESG, especially in the realms of, of, of the environmental and the social side are really finding an enormous amount of traffic given that shift. Um, and also with the, with the rise of, of the millennial generation and the workforce and Gen Z in the workforce, uh, those qualities which were a little foreign 10, 12 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, are now front and center in terms of what companies need to uh, think about and certainly how they need to address and work with their employees. So with the focus on creating you know, a fair and equitable baseline for the workforce, as well as a true sense of, of d and uh, it, it's now a critical path for most, if not all organizations, but especially for those in, in the public and traded markets. In terms of the environmental, I think that couched against, you know, the absolute critical need uh, of the planet to see the reductions of precious resources and our water, uh, to see greater uh, diversion of waste, to not get it into the land, but to recycle, certainly. Um, we're seeing, you know, consumption reductions for our precious resources that most are now pushing. And uh, again, with the focus on resilience, on, on risk analysis, hopefully that shift away from uh, building on our shorelines as much as we have over the last hundred years, um, you know, we'll really see some change. I think that given um, what is going on in the industry, I think that all of us will now be focusing on how do we work and how do we work collectively towards reducing uh, those consumables. And, and I think that really takes, uh, you know, takes a village well, the village includes not just the publicly traded markets, but certainly your private equity, your small boutique, 
Um, I think it's getting all of those folks to the table to become a part of this and helping them understand that there is value in these reductions. It's not just about spending money to accomplish it. There's a lot of ways to both uh, you know, increase your NOI, to drive down your expense lines, and to accomplish all of this while at the same time doing good for, for, for the environment. And I think that getting those folks to the table will be what really ensures success. If we are constantly leaving it to the wealthier, for lack of a better term, organizations, i.e. the publicly traded markets, it, it's going to be difficult because we're carrying a lot of it. And, and obviously uh, in our position where we are happy to be the largest contributor of buildings to the Philly uh, 2030, which is our approach to uh, reducing all the consumables by 50% by 2030, uh, I think getting more players to the table will ensure the, the, the success of those programs, as well as the, the positive benefit that the municipalities, i.e., uh, you guys in the Philly Office of Sustainability uh, will get to benefit from so that we're all collectively rowing in the same direction. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, I think we also have to move on. I really could spend probably an hour with each of you and dig in further, but um, trying to keep keep the time moving along. Um, so next up, we're, we're turning to Mark Hillhouse, the Senior Vice President of Sustainable Finance, uh, U.S. Commercial Banking for HSBC Bank USA. Mark, Mark thank you for joining us. Um, off here, can you tell us a little bit about what the role of banks is in reducing global greenhouse gas emissions? Yeah, th thanks for having me. I, it's, it's great to be here. Uh, um, you know, banks can do a lot of things to support our economy as it transitions to a lower carbon um, sort of environment. I think uh, the, the ways that we're most focused in HSBC are, you know, helping people develop and commercialize the technology that will get us through and then uh, helping kind of disperse that technology and make some of our customers more aware of that technology and also give them credit for, uh, um, for adopting a lot of these technologies. So uh, um, in a kind of more specific way, uh, um, we're very focused on climate tech, which is kind of the new name for clean tech and it encompasses a lot more um, sectors like uh, food and agriculture and transportation than just uh, energy production, which was uh, clean tech's primary focus. Um, we have a venture debt platform that we've allocated $100 million to uh, um, financing uh, climate tech companies over the next couple of years. Uh, you know, we are a great partner for any technology company. It's kind of what we built our business on in the last 10 years in the U.S. Um, because we do have a platform that allows people to bank with us in about 60 plus different countries around the world. Um, and that uh, um, really makes things a lot easier, whether uh, you need to manage your supply chain by having people on the ground, um, you need sales offices, you know, whatever might be important, uh, we're going to be able to support you there. And the venture debt platform is really a great companion for it as companies continue to, uh, to grow. Um, we're also very focused on, uh, on renewable energy. There's really no better market in the world for banks and renewable energy than the U.S. because we have such a robust secondary market between utilities and, uh, and financial investors. Uh, you know, banks can play their normal role of relatively short-term finance as opposed to, to the long-term finance that's often required elsewhere around the globe. And then still, you know, in addition to, uh, to the climate tech world, there's a lot of just uh, what we would call kind of regular way companies that have proven technology, have EBITDA, and we can lend to them on, uh, on either a, a regular cash flow or an asset-based um, um, basis. And, uh, you know, and, and also help to kind of uh, um, promulgate their, uh, their technologies and their products and services all around the world. Um, and then, you know, we help with uh, companies that maybe uh, are looking to transition to a more green economy with a newish product in the banking world that's becoming huge, it has huge acceptance in Europe, becoming more accepted in the U.S. It's called a sustainability linked loan. Um, oftentimes, the starting point is for companies to uh, develop an ESG report. And then we work with them on some of the goals that, uh, whether it's internal or public, um, we work with them on some of the goals that they've developed there. We also have... Uh, um, connections through various technologies that, that companies can use to help them get started on this process as well. Um, but anyway, uh, once um, we've developed some of these goals with the company and uh, developed some uh, metrics for pricing discounts, um, companies generally in the U.S. it's kind of an accepted practice that you um, give a, uh, that you get a discount somewhere two and a half to five basis points on the drawn portion of your credit, and uh, usually it's a, a half to a full basis point on the. Uh, um, on the on the unused, if there is an unused, so there's lots of different ways that uh, you know we feel like we can we can help and 
um, and you know, supporting people in the development and adoption of technology is really among the biggest. Hey, thank you so much. Um, so I think we've all seen disruptions in the supply chain in various ways, whether that's you know toilet paper early on in the pandemic. I'm hearing now that I might not be able to get a good bottle of whiskey in time for Christmas because there's a bottle shortage. So given all of these uh, you know disruptions that we're seeing, how does HSBC help companies maintain a re re reliable supply chain? So there's there's a there is a bunch of stuff going on, just like you said, Christine. It's hard to get a shipping container these days, at least one that's going uh, coming to the U.S. instead of going back to uh, to Asia. Um, there's a you know a little bit of uncertainty within uh, within supply chains, and uh, um, you know what should we do? Should we move things away from China? Should we keep things there? Um, a lot of people are starting to think about that, and there have been some switches made. Um, as a result, so I think that kind of delays things a little bit. And then once we get into the U.S., uh, you know, the ports are uh, are short people and and not able to not working the kinds of hours that maybe they used to. Um, although they've just started again, the uh, um, it'll be hard to find uh, guys driving the trucks to take the stuff away from the port as well. Um, you know, we uh, because we're the largest uh, trade bank in the world, we do more trade transactions than any other. Uh, we are able to uh, get a lot of visibility in the, into the supply chain. And, you know, that's helpful today for making sure your supply chain is resilient and can deal with this shock, you know, better than your competition can. I think that's the, uh, that's the bar that we've set for right now. Um, and then uh, in the future, uh, right now, 80% of an average company's emissions comes from their supply chain. Really hard to kind of benchmark the various players in your supply chain. And uh, we're working with some partners uh, that will both, you know, promote this technology independently, and uh, we hope to adapt it to serve some of our customers as well to uh, just help people, you know, better see what's going on within their supply chain, so that uh, um, so that they can get an idea of uh, of how they're doing against the environmental and social bench benchmarks that they've set for themselves. Really important. Thank you so much. Um, and again, I'd love to spend another hour talking about supply chain with you, but we will move on again. Um, and our, to our last panelist, uh, not least by any stretch, Michael Hughes, the sustain, uh, sustainability and responsible business manager for Accenture. Michael, nice to see you again. You, um, you have uh, at Accenture recently undertaken a research effort with the UN ahead of COP26 regarding CEO perspectives on climate action and sustainability. Are there some early findings that jumped out to you on how businesses are navigating the climate crisis? Absolutely. So we've been working with the UN Global Compact for the last several months, engaging over 1,200 CEOs from 100 different countries to really understand the dynamics at play around sustainability and climate action, especially navigating that through the pandemic. Ultimately, we were trying to shape the voice of business perspective ahead of COP26 and the negotiations taking place here in a couple of weeks. I'd say out of the research, there are three main things we've seen come to the forefront, kind of building off of Mark, your comments. Um, CEOs are experiencing that their businesses are being disrupted now, and particularly around climate change impacts. They are navigating increasingly frequent natural disasters around the world, and they're really feeling a pressure to adapt and build resilience across, particularly their supply chains. Half of the CEOs we spoke with view it as a top risk for them, and 60% have already begun diversifying their material inputs, um, as well as their geographic distribution of operations and workforces in anticipation of these disruptions occurring more and more frequently. I'd say the other, the second big finding was around CEOs feel, feel this is like a wake up call for them to transition to more sustainable business models. So over 80% of the ones we spoke with are already developing new products and services focused around sustainability and climate resilience. Half are engaging in really unique cross-sectoral collaborations to reduce GHG emissions, really stretching those kind of traditional competitive lines we've seen operating in the business community. So they're trying new and innovative ways to work with one another to drive this issue forward. And as many have commented already, we've seen hundreds of companies set net zero emission ambitions as well as science-based targets, which have been really encouraging to see. So business really is trying to take action in whatever ways they can. And the final piece is around, we did a lot of analysis looking at what transformational leadership looks like around sustainability and how it's driving competitive advantage, but how that's being held back a little bit by the lack of the policy action we need. So aside from the diversification I've mentioned, leaders around this topic are really pushing quite hard on R&D around climate resilience and their products and services. They're in particular taking action around accountability. So making sure that executives are incentivized to take action on climate and 
probably most critically, they're actually focused on reskilling and training their people on climate issues so that anyone from people out in the field, at the manufacturing site, at headquarters, understand sustainability and their role in it. And I think companies are driving that on their own, but that success is only going to go so far. And as we've been discussing throughout this panel, businesses are really hoping for a lot from COP26 to get those NDCs aligned to 1.5 degree pathway. We need to find ways to do carbon pricing mechanisms in different regions, providing that necessary financing to transition, you know, particularly the global south to this net zero world. So I think a lot of interesting insights to come out of the research we've done. The full report will be out in a couple of weeks. So I'll be glad to share that with anyone of interest, but those are just a few of the early insights. Very interesting. I'd be really excited to take a look at more of those when they come out. Um, so as you and I recently talked about um, on, in a different uh, panel, part of tackling the climate crisis is finding the ways that we can use technology to accelerate efforts at mitigation and adaptation and resilience. Mm -hmm. So how are you seeing clients and businesses leveraging technology to, to tackle climate change? So I think it's in one way helping us better understand the world we live in today as, one, as well as the one we will live in in the decades ahead. So one of an example is AT&T partnered with some of the national labs here in the US to develop this really interesting climate modeling tool using artificial intelligence so they can understand where to best place their towers and other infrastructure to withstand the various climate events they're going to face across their operations, as well as where to store equipment and kind of supplies for when they or for example, when a hurricane cuts across Florida and the repair crews come in, where is it most strategic to have those reserve facilities and equipment available so they can quickly get the network back up online? As a, you know, mobile devices are quite critical in these types of natural disaster events. How do you get that infrastructure back up quite quickly? So we're trying to understand the world we are living in and the one we are going to be living in ahead. But beyond that, I think technology is really enabling more of those sustainable products and services. So we're seeing even commonplace digital investments around the movement to cloud, having great benefits for GHG reduction. We're seeing these hyperscaler companies in Microsoft, Amazon, Google use their scale to help drive down energy consumption at the facility. So for any company that's moved to those types of organizations for their technology infrastructure, that really contributes to your own you know, various emissions reductions, which is quite exciting to see. You have your traditional technologies like robotics, which are being deployed to help break down electronics, where you know it's very hard for human dexterity to break apart an iPhone, but a robot can do it quite quickly and keep all those materials in circularity. And look at even traditional players like SAP and Salesforce, who are really building new sustainability products to help companies tackle that challenge around managing ESG for their own footprints. You know, it's quite difficult for an organization to keep track of all the various sustainability levers. And so a lot of these companies that run those back-end systems are really trying to innovate and help bring it all together, which is quite a monumental task, thinking about kind of scope one, two, and three emissions across the value chain. So I think technology has a lot of promise as we deal with the exponential challenges around climate change, but we still have a little ways to go in terms of just the core functionality, but even more tactically, some of the affordability and access challenges a lot of these organizations have, whether they be in the global south, whether they be small businesses. So I think some of that has to be resolved before we can really bring the full power of technology to bear to help tackle the climate crisis. Great, thank you so much, Michael. So we are now going to move to Q&A and we've had some good questions in the chat. Um, I'm actually gonna start with one um, that I think is probably primarily for Kate um, to answer. I know she has to drop off a little early, so I wanted to start um, with, with this one. Um, the question comes from Stephanie Young, um, it's, and basically um, paraphrasing, it's basically from your remarks and Elliot's remarks, it sounds like the private sector buy-in is increasingly and maybe even most important component in tackling climate change. Um, but COP has traditionally only included sort of the you know, uh, public sector actors. Um, so, you know, and, and Ron had mentioned it, more players need to be brought to the table. So might it be worth including major private sector delegates at future COPs to increase their involvement and accountability? Your thoughts, Kate? Yeah, no, um, I mean, to be honest, we completely agree. We've set up that COP26 will be a kind of inclusive and all of society COP, and you'll see that across all of the events um, as information comes out over the next few weeks. So, um, yeah, we completely agree. We are not solve climate change as we need to unless we bring governments together, private sector together, subnational governments together. Um, so you'll see at COP that actually be a lot of private sector engagement at some of the 
some of the key events right across the piece um, to kind of to tell that broader story. And um, to be honest, I would say really the significant majority of our initiatives that are all being kind of launched at or for COP26 will have a kind of private sector component. So um, yeah, I, I completely agree that that's absolutely vital and hopefully it'll be something you will see a lot across COP26 and then all COPs going forward. Great, thank you, Kate. Um, moving on to another question. Um, this one comes from Jessica Sember um, from Job and Engineering. I love this question. Um, how can we improve waste management systems in cities like Philadelphia? So I think you all may have something to contribute here, whether that's an example from Wales or a technology that can help uh, improve waste management um, or what uh, maybe Brandywine's doing with the 2030 district on waste reduction. I think a bunch of you have probably ideas about how we can improve our fairly archaic system of making trash and throwing the landfill. Um, so any, anyone wanna jump in first? I'll, I'll, I'll take what we're doing. Um, one of the things we've done, and again, creating that, that partnership, especially with our tenants, is we have um, put in our leases now demanding 75% diversion of all construction waste. So that's one of the ways we can contribute because frankly, that's where a lot of it is, right? As we're taking down or redeveloping buildings, it's sourcing all of those uh, recyclables to make sure that they are uh, captured properly. On the waste side, uh, honestly, I think a lot of the vendors have really stepped up, uh, the waste management of the world, the republics of the world, and they can now provide that information. Fact is though, you have to ask for it. So what we do on our end is we track monthly throughout the entire country, all of our waste, diversion, what's made, what is actually getting into a landfill, which we're never happy about, certainly, and, and how we can drive uh, those numbers up. I will say that happily, I believe in our GRES reporting this year, we diverted 58.7% um, of our total waste. Again, offlier year, outlier year, if you will, given COVID, but nonetheless, monitoring, staying on top of it, and being aggressive in how you manage it, little, uh, manage it excuse me, a little different in an office building than a retail, where the retailers all have their own and now you have to work with them. But again, that tenant partnership is crucial and critical to everything and anything we're going to be able to accomplish as corporations uh, in the CSG realm. And happy to add in on the technology side. So I think there's a few different elements around waste management. There's been a lot of interesting innovation from organizations like Rubicon and others um, around traditional things like routing. So trying to optimize truck routes within a city, but even beyond that, you know, everyone is kind of scheduled to be picked up on a given day or a set of days during the week. Uh, but if you're a restaurant and like business is a little slow, like your trash is still getting picked up even if your dumpster's half full. So how do you actually optimize that? So you're only paying for actually getting a full dumpster taken and not having these trucks running around just picking up half empty dumpsters. Um, so there's some of that piece that you can just kind of optimize and be more efficient. But when you look at actually the waste management facilities themselves, there's some interesting technology around using image recognition to actually do some of that diversion in terms of pulling out plastics and other things that you, you just can't have people sitting on a line doing that manually. You need robotics and some AI to actually enable that. There is some interesting innovation, but it is certainly, to your point, Christine, it's an archaic infrastructure. So there's a lot of investment that is required to actually transition it over to something more technology friendly and more sustainable, ultimately. Can I just add targets? <clears throat> That's mm -hmm. been a success in Wales. It is setting targets by the Welsh Government for all the local authorities. So we've gone from 5% household recycling in 20 years ago to 60% um, today. So setting those targets at that city level is gonna drive change. Lots more lessons as well. I'm gonna just plug them into the link there as well. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else on this question? All right, I will move to the next one. Um, this one's from Alyssa Boyle, who's a student at St. Joseph's, which is a rival of Villanova, but I won't say anything about that. Um, the question is, some environmental activists are concerned about the potential of greenwashing of policies and practices by both leaders in business and in politics. How can we, we be sure that the policies and practices are in fact bringing us closer to our net zero goal and not just creating the impression of sustainability? Which is a great question. Um, open to anyone here jumping in and taking an answer at how we ensure accountability. I think that, I would, you know, the sorry, governance is really important, just like in so many areas. Uh, um, you know, whenever uh, there are a number of kind of different things going on in the in the market right now that we see, you know, relative, to, particularly to sustainability linked loans, where you know the goals aren't particularly lofty compared to public announcements. The uh, 
Um, you know, maybe it's, uh, you know, they're just not particularly lofty compared to everybody's kind of, uh, you know, typical goal of being, I don't know, somewhere 15 to 30 percent uh, emissions reduction by 2030, um, you know, in a, in a manufacturing environment. I think that, uh, you know, and I, unfortunately or fortunately or unfortunately, you know, this is going to change over time to what's not greenwashing today may end up becoming greenwashing as we get uh, further down the path. So we want to keep our eyes and ears open for that. And some things, uh, you know, may end up, you know, be that are considered, uh, you know, kind of off limits today, um, you know, may not be considered off limits a number of uh, number of years from now. You take, for example, all the shortages that we're expecting in natural gas and companies that are developing carbon, carbon capture devices for natural gas plants. Yes, getting the natural gas out of the ground still creates emissions, but, uh, um, you know, burning it creates more and, uh, you know, it could be a could be, you know, somewhat viable over the long run. There's a number of articles in The Economist the last couple of weeks about, uh, you know, from that perspective. And uh, from my uh, from my side, I, I would say that greenwashing, it's interesting. I think it'll always be around, but it's less and less and less. There is a lot more transparency. There's a lot more deliberate transparency as a result of all the reporting schemas that's out there. Uh, and I think, frankly, with Biden's plan, um, through, or I'm sorry, not Biden's plan, through, through the SEC with Gensler's plan, there will be a lot more transparent requirement so that that greenwashing is really eradicated because frankly, to, to, to the, to the uh, question asker's point, it doesn't do anyone any good. And if you really wanna know what everyone's doing, we should be able to provide you with the documentation and backup to support everything we've stated. Anyone else? All right, we've got two minutes left. I want to throw one more question out um, that's come up uh, from two people, um, or it's a similar question from two people. Um, but in short, the question is, um, being that younger generations are going to be the ones who inherit this mess, what can be done to um, listen to youth and put them in leadership and get them uh, more engaged in, in COP and in uh, other sort of efforts moving forward? Any, any thoughts from our panelists? I mean, it's, I mean, getting youth engaged has been very critical. Certainly, as we look at I think some of the other panelists, you know, the war for talent has been quite intense, and in, younger employees are really valuing that in terms of where they choose to work. So companies have to take action to actually attract the best talent. At least what we're trying to do is, whenever you're innovating a new idea, we try to make sure we have different generations, different life experiences represented. As you know, you and I have previously talked about this, making sure you have that diversity of you to actually get to the most innovative ideas. Because um, I think historically, you know, some of the leadership within sustainability has been a little homogenous in terms of our life experience. So bringing in people from, you know, underserved communities or from youth is critical to us actually getting to the most, the best ideas and solutions we ultimately can. So I just encourage people to just keep fighting. And that's what we're all trying to do in our own ways is just fight and get engaged. And ultimately, I think when you reach out to senior people who are, inter who are leading these efforts, we're always looking for more help. There's plenty of work to go around. So please reach out. We're here to kind of help get you engaged and involved. I think Michael is so right, casting the net wide for all young people to be able to contribute to coming up with the solutions. So we've established the Future Generations Leadership Academy in Wales, doing exactly what Michael talked about, going to those underprivileged areas of Wales where young people don't often get opportunities to talk about leadership and sustainable development and open up these opportunities for them. So um, yeah, thinking about every single young person in your region uh, as having uh, you know the ability to come up with a really neat solution um, would be really important so um, yeah I couldn't agree more with, with Michael's comments. Wonderful well thank you all for contributing questions there was more than we could get to today but lots of really great uh, questions and um, great remarks from all of our panelists at, at this point I'm going to turn it back to Lauren to close us out. Great right. thanks so much Christine and to all of our panelists Elliot, Kate, Jonathan, Michael, Mark, and Ron, more to come. I hope this program for all those in the audience uh, hit the right balance of inspiring and finding solutions and ideas and learning what's happening in our local community, as well as heeding that call to action, that action is required and it's required soon. All eyes on COP26, and maybe we'll do a follow-up with these thought leaders on what happens. Partnership with BABC is always much appreciated and bringing that binational global approach to how we can do better in Philly is where we like to land. Thank you for today's sponsors of our program, Duane Morris and the Welsh government. And thanks to all of our partners from the international community here in Philadelphia and beyond. We wish you all a good afternoon. Thank you.